It's, it's summertime, and back in my old job as a, as a head coach, summertime meant weightlifting, training for, for our athletes and our athletic programs. And in my experience, it seems to be a little different here, but in my experience, it was the most difficult job was getting young boys to start coming into the weight room. You know why that was the hardest job? Because it's very hard to be the weak kid in the weight room. I've been that kid. It is hard to be the weak boy in there. So as a coach, I always thought a big part of my job was encouraging younger, junior high boys, freshman boys, just to get started in the weight room. And I had a couple different speeches I would give. And, and one of them is, is just, you know, if you get started and you work consistently, you won't, you'll get stronger. You won't always be the weak kid. But more importantly, I always wanted to, to preach what the real purpose of the weight room was. The real purpose of the weight room, I would tell these young boys, we're not in here so that you can have some giant bench press number. That's not the point, right? You, you may never bench press as much as Sasquatch over there who's been coming for six years. But that's not, that's not the point. We're in here because you, you love these games and these sports and everybody loves to, to win. And if we all get in here together, you individually, you'll have a, a better chance of playing the game you love to play because you'll be faster and stronger and, and, and more athletic. And if we all do that together, uh, those goals we have will be much more attainable. The purpose of the weight room was not so that I could be the strongest kid and look down on the weaker kids. It was to help us achieve bigger goals that really didn't have, I mean, the weight room helped, but it was just a tool toward our bigger goals. So it was hard to get younger boys started because it's hard to be the weak boy in the weight room. Now, guess who made it harder for those young boys to get started? The older boys. Because it only took, it only took one comment. Oh, that's all you're going to put on that bar? That's all you work out with? Right? It only took one comment like that. And then that boy no longer wanted to be in there. So in stretches, we had a culture in our athletic programs where the younger boys would be hurting our athletic programs by not being in the weight room. But our older boys were hurting our athletic programs by actually being in the weight room because they were fighting against the purpose. You see, if you just want to be the strongest kid in the weight room, you actually don't want other kids to come in and work hard consistently because they might wind up being stronger than you and what you really want is to be the strongest kid. But that's not the purpose of our weights program. What we always wanted to create is a culture where it was okay to start out young and weak and we would celebrate growth. Now, I tell you all that because a local church can be a lot like a weights program. It really can. It is really easy to forget what the church is for, what this building is for, why we come here. It's really, in the same way where like, I didn't want any of our athletes to think me getting the highest bench press is my purpose. Like, I wasn't a bench press coach. I, like I, so that wasn't the purpose. It was a tool, but not the purpose. And if we confuse those things, bad stuff would happen. Well, in a church, it's really easy to get stuff that seems like it could be the point, 
but it's not really the point, and bad stuff starts to happen. For example, and we're going to talk about several of these today. This is a Berean church, which just means uh, in the book of Acts, there's a town in Greece called Berea. And then and the people there, the Bereans, it says they searched the scriptures to see if the stuff Paul said was true. So we took that as, as the name of this fellowship of churches we're in because we search the scriptures for our truth. We get our truth out of this book. So this book's very important. Knowing this book is very important. But it's pretty easy to, to feel like the point of being here is to know the most about this book. And that's not the point. It, it's important. But when we, when we start to act like I want to be the one who knows the most... Well, what good is that if I don't, you know, somehow let it be known that I know the most? And then we can create an environment that makes it hard to be the weak kid in the weight room. So when somebody else comes in and, you know, and they, they don't know the book of Exodus from the book of 1 Peter. They can feel like the message that's being sent is... <laughs> You don't know the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. Oh, what a lightweight. That person doesn't want to be the weak kid in that weight room. It's really easy to, to get um, like the rooting out of sin as the main point of a church. And it's not behavior control. We exist to, to stop sin. Now, don't misunderstand what, I, what I'm saying here. Um, sinning more is bad. <laughs> sinning less is way better than sinning more. But here's what happens when, when the message we send is that our main goal and purpose is to reduce sin it makes it very hard for someone who's stuck in sin to be the weak kid in our weight room. Right? It's very easy to, to show up and as sin is railed against, it's easy to feel like the, the message being sent is, oh, you still struggle with that kind of sin? Heavens to Murgatroyd. What is someone like you doing in here. There are other things. I'll mention some more. But like when, when, when behavior control and rooting out sin becomes our main thing, all it does is just drive our sin underground. It makes it really, really difficult to confess any sin. Because if I confess the sin, I will feel like the weak kid in the weight room. So we deceive ourselves into thinking we're, na we're nailing this purity and morality thing because my main goal is that no one finds out about any of my sin. And all the while, when we get the wrong thing as the main thing, we will wind up making this a very easy weight room to avoid. That's basically what Paul's going to talk about today. We're going to limit ourselves to just two verses from Philippians chapter 3 because they're, they're, a very, they're very easy verses to misunderstand. They're kind of difficult to kind of get on first reading. But these verses are all about striving for maturity, real Christian maturity. But if we don't know what that is, it's really hard to strive toward it. So let's read our two verses. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. There's our whole passage. They read this way. Let us, therefore, as many as are, and then some of our Bibles use the word perfect. Some of our Bibles use the word mature. And I'll talk about why that is in a minute. But Paul says, as many of us are mature or perfect, let us have this attitude or this mindset. 
And if in anything you have a different attitude or mindset, God will reveal how wrong you are also. Verse 16, however, let us keep living by that sta same standard to which we have attained. There's our passage, the whole thing. Um, we start with the first thing that's difficult to understand, where Paul says, let those of us who are perfect or mature embrace this point of view. So what, is, what does this mean? Let those of us who are uh, perfect, uh, one translation even puts the word perfect in quotation marks. The Greek word used here, um, it, can, it can mean either of these words. It can mean our idea of perfect, or it can mean the opposite of childish. And that's just the way language works, right? Like, if I write P-E-N, pen, you don't know if I'm talking about a pen or the place that I write with or the place where you keep your dog, right? Same word. How do you know which one I'm talking about? We have to read the context around it. So when a translator comes to this word, they have to decide 2,000 years ago, what did Paul mean when he uh, put this Greek word in there? Did he, does he mean perfect or does he mean mature? I'll give you an example of a spot where it means mature just so you can... So you can uh, see it. Oh, before I do that, whatever Paul means, whatever way we want to translate this, Paul doesn't mean sinlessly perfect. And we know this because it's been two weeks for us because we had a guest speaker, but Paul just told us he's not perfect. Up in verse 12, Paul said, I've, I have not already attained this, that, uh, that is, I have not already been perfected. And there's a, there's a verb there that means perfect. Our, our understanding of perfect. So Paul's already told us, I am not perfect. And then today, he says, those of you who are perfect. So it doesn't mean that kind of perfect. Here's an example of a place where this Greek word is used that means mature. So brethren, this is to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14. Do not be children in your thinking. And, and evil be infants, but in your thinking be the opposite of those two things. And here's the same Greek word. Well, obviously there he means mature, which is a, a normal understanding of that word. So it can be either way. So what's a translator to do? Therefore, let those of us who are blank. I think mature is the best understanding of this. Why would a translator go with perfect? Well, there's two ways. The New English translation uses perfect in quotes, and then they give a footnote that explains why. They think Paul is speaking with his tongue firmly in his cheek. Uh, still talking about the Judaizers who think you have to live according to the law or you can't be a Christian. And they think Paul is saying, hey, go tell those guys who are perfect that they should actually have my point of view, my attitude. Uh, the New American Standard Bible that we read out of, they, they put perfect because we have, in some sense, as Christians, been made perfect. Our justification by faith, when we believe in Christ, that great trade-off happens. All of my sin went on Him at the cross, right? And then, when I believe His righteousness gets put on my account, I try to, I always... Uh, Equate that to a personnel file. You know what a personnel file is? If, you have an, if, you, in a, if you're in a company and everything you do that's good or bad goes in your personnel file, our justification when we believe in Christ, all the bad stuff, everything that we did in our life, good stuff, bad stuff, worthless stuff, gets nailed to the cross. And then the contents of Jesus' personnel file gets put in our. So, so that when we get judged, we get judged based on Jesus' life, not ours. And that's great news. That's our justification. So in that way, we have been made perfect. So that understanding would go like this. Paul's saying, those of us who've been justified by faith in Christ, you should have the attitude that I've been explaining. But I want us to think this morning this way. Do you consider yourself a mature Christian? 
Do you want to be a mature Christian? If so, Paul will say you have to embrace this point of view or this mindset or this way of thinking. But he doesn't tell us what the way of thinking is. It's what he just talked about, which again for us has been two weeks. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Here's what Paul has said. This is a mature Christian. Paul has decided he has turned his back on any hope that in his flesh, in his ability, he can make God like him by how good he acts. He's given up on that. He has the righteousness that comes by faith, and that leaves him with one aim in life, one goal, one thing he wants more than anything else. You remember what that is? He wants to know Jesus Christ. I think this is Paul's definition of Christian maturity. He is a, or she is a mature Christian who wants to know Jesus Christ more than she wants anything else in the world. That's Christian maturity. Paul has said he's not even there yet, and he's the Apostle Paul. So this is a process. Do you know every sin we sin could be chalked up to a failure in our Christian maturity? Think about it. Every time I sin, I have decided there's something else I want more than I want him. There's something else more valuable to me than my relationship with him. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll use David. Maybe there's, there's something I don't want David to know because he might think less of me, so I lie about that to David. You know what I've just done? I've just elevated David's opinion of me above Jesus' my relationship with Jesus. It's a failure of maturity. Here's, that's what Paul is saying. If we don't understand this, we'll misunderstand the rest of it. If you want to be mature in this Christianity thing, you have to have what I've been talking about, this aim, this desire that, you, that sees your relationship with Jesus Christ as more valuable than anything else in the world. That's Christian maturity. And when we get anything else put in place of that as the way we measure maturity or as how we define Christian maturity, bad things will start to happen in my life and in a group of lives put together in a local church. Like, can't these things define our Christian maturity? We've talked about the first two. What if, can't we, can we measure Christian maturity by how much you know about the Bible? We can't. And I can prove it to you very quickly. Because there are many non-Christians who know way more about that book than anyone in, anyone in this room. There are all kinds of scholars, professors, who know, know this book inside and out. They don't believe it's the inspired, inerrant, sufficient Word of God. So are they mature Christians? No. They're not even Christians. Elimination of sin, we've talked about before. I'll come back to that in a minute. How about this? Why can't we measure Christian maturity by how much and how well you and I serve other people? That can't be a bad thing. It's a good thing. Can't serving other people be the measure of my Christian maturity? The answer is no, because again, you don't have to be a Christian to serve other people. There are lots of organizations who feed the poor, who help the abused, who house the homeless, who do all kinds of great things. They're not mature Christians. Many are not even Christians. So that can't be the measure of our Christian maturity. How about this one? How about the measure of your Christian liberty is the measure of your Christian Maturity. That goes like this. The real mature Christians are the ones who don't get hung up on old-fashioned behavioral rules. The most mature are the ones who are most free 
to do whatever they feel like is correct. Can we measure Christian maturity that way? No. Christian maturity is a great thing. Excuse me, Christian liberty is a great thing. Another, all these are great things. If they come with a person who wants to know Jesus Christ worse than they want anything else in the world. If I'm maturing in my knowledge and my love and my relationship of Jesus Christ, then all these things come from the right spot and they become fantastic things. If I want to know Jesus Christ worse than I want anything else, then I will have an, oops, then I will have an appetite for this book. But not so that I can hold it over you. Not so I can control others. Because I want to know the one this book is about. And if I want to know Jesus Christ more than I want anything else in the world, the elimination of sin comes because the more I know Him, the more I want to be with Him, the more I trust Him, the more I trust that the way He's told me to live in here is actually better. It will lead to more joy. And so the sin gets eliminated because I want, to, I want Him. I will serve others more if I desire that relationship with Him. Because if I'm following the one who came not to be served, but to serve. Well, if I'm following someone like that, won't he make me into a servant? Of course. And Christian liberty is a wonderful thing for someone who wants to know Jesus Christ worse than he or she wants anything else. Because it sets me free from that hamster wheel of God likes me because I'm doing pretty good today. Oh no, I messed up. God hates me again. Woe is me. Now what do I do? I'm free from all that. But so-called Christian liberty is a trap for someone whose main desire is their own desires. So, the mature Christian, Paul has said, the mature Christian is someone who can honestly say, I want Jesus Christ more than I want anything else in this world. That is what we're supposed to be fighting for in our lives. Straining toward. And if we don't understand that, we'll never understand the rest of this passage and this error message that shows up. So Paul says, therefore, those of us who are mature better embrace this point of view I've been talking about, which just says, I want Jesus Christ more than I want anything else. Everything else seems like garbage compared to knowing him. And then Paul says this, if you've got a different idea, God will reveal to you the error of your ways. That underlined portion on the screen, if you take that out of its context, you can do really terrible stuff with that half verse. Because it can sound like Paul's saying this. That Christian can think whatever he or she wants, and this other Christian can think whatever he or she wants, and you just have to let God straighten them out. You can't really, we shouldn't be correcting anyone's errors. That's up to God. That's not at all what Paul was saying. Here's how we know. If Paul did anything in his letters, it was correct people's errors. He did it constantly. Constantly. Here's what Paul is saying. If you want to be mature, you have to embrace the point of view I've been talking about where Christian maturity is, I want Jesus Christ, my relationship with him, more than I want anything else. And then Paul says, if you've got a different idea about what Christian maturity looks like, eventually, here's the promise, God will reveal to you how wrong that is. Someday, I will figure out, I, this was a, if I'm humble enough to admit it, I had the wrong measure of Christian maturity. Maturity. 
when a church gets the wrong definition of Christian maturity, we become a weight room nobody wants to be in. Right? If it's behavior control and rooting out sin, people with sin problems don't want, there's, there's no place for me there. I can't be there. And if I'm there, I just have to shut up about what I'm actually dealing with because they don't know how to handle it. You know, in, in human relationships, we have this really weird thing where relationships get worse when someone confesses. And that's backwards, right? So we hide, we deny, we lie, because as soon as I admit, yes, it was me, I did it, that's when stuff gets bad. But God prescribed the confession of sin. That's when stuff gets better. There has to be room. It, it, like, man, don't, don't, don't post this on your Facebook or anything, but like there has to be room for sin in the church. Gosh, that sounds terrible. But if we can't confess sin, what, like, what are we doing and who are we helping? There has to be room to confess and be accepted and loved, right? And when we get the elimination of all sin as the measurement of maturity, that is not what will happen. When we get Bible knowledge as the measure of Christian maturity, the church will slowly become a, a small collection of experts And it makes it very hard to come in and be the one that doesn't know anything. And again, who are we reaching? It's hard to be the weak kid in the weight room. When so-called Christian freedom becomes the mark of maturity, the people's love of their sin will, will destroy a church from the inside. And eventually, we will see the error of those ways. Paul finishes, verse 16, by saying this, only or uh, primarily or of greatest importance, let us live up to what we have already attained. He doesn't tell us what that is. <laughs> let us live up to what we have already attained. Well, it's we, so he's talking about Christians. What is it as Christians that we have already attained? It was a free gift but we've got it. That justification that I talked about, the personnel file thing, makes us eternally righteous before a righteous God. We have that. And it gives us access into a relationship with the God of the universe through a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. We have that. It was a gift, but we've grabbed it. And Paul says, we should spend our lives living up to that relationship that we have. You see, it's really easy to understand justification. Wait a minute, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm eternally righteous before God. Well, sweet. Now I can do whatever I want. I can just go crazy because God has to forgive me in the end. Well, Paul says, man, what could be more immature than thinking I can be made happier somewhere besides the one who did that for me. Paul says Christian maturity is understanding that relationship is best and then living up to that relationship. This doesn't mean live up to that standard of perfection. This is not try really hard to be perfect. It's not. Paul made really clear he puts no stock in his own, his, his willpower's ability to make himself perfect. He's done with that. When we think that way, again, we become that church that thinks rooting out sin is its purpose. All that does is drive sin underground, makes it impossible to confess, 
And it always turns into ignoring tons of sin God would love to see us root out. What we do when we make behavior control and rooting out sin our purpose, without knowing it, we'll create a list of very sinny sins that folks like us avoid, and then we will feel like we are nailing this moral and pure moral purity thing because we don't get drunk, we don't get high, we don't sleep around, and we could add some more. And the problem is, I will ignore. I'll deceive myself into thinking that I'm living up to some standard of righteousness while I ignore my selfishness, my greed. The way I put, try to get my security from earthly things. I will ignore my bitterness, my lack of forgiveness, my lack of charity. And on and on and on. Now, can the frequency of my sin damage my relationships? The answer is yes. I have a relationship with Rachel. In fact, today we've been married 23 years as of today. Congratulations to me. Yes. Congratulations to me, and you can send her your condolences whenever you would like. Um, the more I sin against Rachel, is that going to have an effect on our relationship? The more Rachel sins against me, is that going to have an effect on our relationship? If we both dive into working on the relationship, will that have an effect on how much we sin against one another? Yes. If our relationship is based on keeping score on who sinned the most and who sinned the worst, and this is just like last time, you know what we will start doing? We will not confess anything. I will deny, no, no, you're wrong to think I did that. And all that is is I don't want to be the weak kid in this weight room. I can't confess because I will know, or she can't confess because she will know I will use that against her, push her down, hold her down. So, so we just deny, we deflect, we'll do anything but confess because it makes our relationship worse. We have attained through our faith in Christ a relationship with the God of the universe. So yes, our sin has terrible impacts, but still the goal is the relationship. If I work on the relationship, if I desire that relationship, the sin will in some ways take care of itself, and where it doesn't, I have a desire to root out that because of my relationship. Me rooting out the sin is not the basis of my relationship. God, it's not that God likes me now because I no longer do that. No, no, no. God liked me then enough to kill his son so he could have a relationship with me. And I want to nurture that relationship, which will include the elimination of the sin, which is just me thinking there's something better than him which is ridiculous. And I want to show you, I, I try to stay just in whatever passage we are teaching, but I just want to show you one other little paragraph from the New Testament that teaches this same thing so that you can know, like if this, this might be new for some of you. And I want you to know I'm not just making this up and I'm not just twisting this one passage because if, if Jesus had a best friend during his life, it was John. And John wrote a book about having a relationship with Jesus. And he said, you guys can have this relationship that I have with Jesus. It's the book of 1 John. And very early in the book, he talks about this. And John says this, if, if we say, this is 1 John 1, starting in verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, with the Lord, and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie, we do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, what does it mean to walk in the darkness and walk in the light? Here's what it does not mean. Walking in the darkness does not mean sinning lots, and walking in the light does not mean sinning very little. Here's how we know. First, if we walk in the light, we get cleansed from the sins we sin. So apparently we sin while we walk in the light. Here's how else we know. The very next verse, after John says, don't walk in darkness, walk in the light, and just in case you don't, so you don't get the wrong idea, we're right here now. John says, by the way, if we say we, he includes himself, if we say that we have no sin, we're just deceiving ourselves. Do you see that? Are you tracking with me? He says, walk in the light. And by the way, you sin. So don't think walking in the light means getting to a place where you don't sin anymore. Because if you think you don't sin, you're deceiving yourself. And he includes himself. Walking in the darkness is hiding. Walking in the light is being exposed. Walking in darkness is living that, giant air quotes, Christian life where I pretend I'm nailing this. I don't confess anything. You can't, you can't tell me I'm doing anything wrong. You haven't seen me do anything wrong. The old Bart Simpson. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me, and you can't prove anything. That's walking in the darkness. Walking in the light is, Lord, expose my sin to me. In the same way it's exposed to you. When we get there, then look what happens. If we confess the sin as it gets exposed by the light, he is faithful and he is righteous or just to forgive all of our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. The way to eliminate sin is to walk exposed before God, open with Him, so that He can show you the sin that you really have, so He can show me the sin I really have, so that He, as I confess that to Him, can not only forgive me of that, but clean me up from it. Does that make sense? That is living up to what we've already obtained, which is this relationship with God. It's not living down here trying to make myself good enough that he'll finally like me. The family, that's Christian maturity. We're supposed to strive for, work for Christian maturity. It's not that there's no working in Christianity. There's lots of working on my own life. But what I'm working on is my relationship to Jesus Christ because I want him more than I want anything else. And when I find myself, you know what? I think I'm wanting money or promotions or prestige or the opinion of it. But when I'm wanting someone else other than him, I am wrong. So I strive for knowing him because he's because he's better. We just have to make sure what we're striving for is actual maturity and not some clever counterfeit. And so as we do that together, we want to make a weight room that's welcoming to the weak kid. You know why that's so important? Because if you think you're not a weak kid, you are deceiving yourself and the truth is not in you. That's what John just said. We are all the weak kid. The Apostle Paul in the previous paragraph said, I haven't obtained this. I'm not there yet. It's the Apostle Paul. If he doesn't have a perfect relationship with Jesus yet, So we create an environment that is welcoming to the weak kid, but listen, without celebrating weakness. 
The goal is not weakness. The goal is not to stay. Like I don't want, I didn't want young kids to come into the weight room to just be wallflowers flowers and decorate the place. Man, get to work. We got stuff to do. So we want to be welcoming to the weak. We want to admit that we are weak. And then we want to pursue Christ together because we have a great commission to be working on. And we will only do that well if we're working on our own individual relationships with Jesus Christ and helping other people to see what we find the most value in. And if we don't find the most value in our relationship to Christ, we'll never convince anyone else it's what they should want to. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you for uh, this little tiny confusing passage um, and for encouraging us to pursue Christian maturity, which is simply this, that, that we would know you better. And if we know you better, we will love you more, because to know you is to love you. And if we know you better and love you more, we will trust you more with our lives, uh, with our decisions, with our finances, with our free time, with our marriages, with all that stuff. God, we want to know you more and more because that's what this Christian maturity thing is all about. And, and we want to press on toward maturity, God. Help us see the error of our ways where we've substituted other things in for that. God, help us to welcome the weak and, and admit our own weakness and have, a, have an environment here that is welcoming to other weak people that we might press on toward maturity together to your glory until that day we know you perfectly. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and finish with our musicians?